I don't often talk about strategy games on my channel, and the reason for that is simple. One, two, three, four. I'm a dirty hippie and consider myself a pacifist. But when I play Civ V, Getting resources, securing my borders, making me less bored, bullying city-states, and pissing off other civs. And when you destroy an entire civilization, other civs start to get all mad for some reason. Hey! What the fuck you want? Uh, I want you to stop killing everyone, you goddamn maniac! You know what I did to the last guy that told me to stop killing everyone? You nuked him! What? Oh, no, no. That guy had citrus. What, what the? Citrus? I really needed citrus. Of course, you don't need to become Generalissimo Cobbler, destroyer of worlds in Civ V. You can pursue scientific enlightenment, world peace, cultural domination. You make friends, enemies, uneasy alliances, and bitter rivals. Civ V doesn't have much of a story on paper. You get one of a few victory conditions, watch a cutscene, and that's it. But the true story of Civilization V is you interacting with the AI, and the AI reacting to and remembering your actions. It's interesting, narratively speaking. I mean, the other civs are just big clouds of ones and zeros, yet I get so emotionally wrapped up in these games. It's one thing to hate a character that's, you know, written as a villain. That's normal. That's what's supposed to happen. But truly hating what is essentially just a microwave with Gandhi's face taped to it? I mean, they do have certain agendas, likes, and dislikes, but they're just... systems. Every action they take is just a response to my actions. I mean, I fucking hate some of them. And the game really does do a good job of making me feel like they hate me. He's mad. Gandhi 2. No more Mr. Passive Resistance. When I invade a country that used to have a defensive pact with me, it doesn't feel like I'm just clicking a button. It feels like I just stabbed someone in the back. When an AI that used to be my ally denounces me, it feels like I disappointed them. Is there something here? I am drunk with this vision. Middle Earth Shadow of War is a fantastic game that you shouldn't play. Like, okay, close your eyes and imagine a game. That's Middle Earth Shadow of War. You climb towers, you can be stealthy or aggressive, there are light RPG mechanics, you play as a bearded white man with a tragic backstory. Man, it's probably a good thing I can't grow decent facial hair. Because it seems like if I did, my family would instantly die tragically and I'd have to start spending all my free time hiding in bushes and stabbing dudes. The story is particularly lame. The only interesting thing about the protagonist is he shares his body with an ancient elf ghost who also has a tragic backstory. The villain is just, you know, Sauron, who is hot take incoming. Pretty lame. He just wears cool armor. How is he actually evil? I never understood that. Like Darth Vader, chokes a bitch out within five minutes of appearing on screen. Voldemort tries to kill a baby and is in charge of magical Isis. I can't remember Sauron doing anything really evil. He's just dressed evil and commands an army of other people dressed evil. Just give me a scene of him cutting in line at the bank or something so I can really hate him. I'm sure he does all sorts of evil shit in the Silmarillion or J.R.R. Tolkien's notes that he wrote down on napkins, but I'm illiterate so you can fuck off with your nerd shit. But who cares about Sauron? The true villain of Middle-Earth Shadow of War is Arjanek. The biggest, baddest son of a bitch in Middle-Earth. He killed me. Twice. He broke my sword. I went to turn his bodyguard against him. Then he ambushed me. I drove him insane. You are the need for <laughs> then he killed me. Again. My rivalry with Arjanek was one of epic proportions. So simple. It was all so simple. Know your fucking place, trash! He was procedurally generated. The game calls it the Nemesis System. 
Each orc has a unique personality, name, face, and a few strengths and weaknesses. When a random nameless orc kills you, he's given a name, promoted up the ranks of the army, and he remembers your history with him. In the first act of the game, this culminates in a big coliseum fight. Orcs who've killed you in the game earlier show up and mock you before you yeet their mortal souls out of their body in front of an audience of orcs. And then... I have upheld my end of the bargain! And your champion has upheld his for fighting this pitiful enemy. The Dark Lord promised mercy. Gaze now upon the Bright Lord. I make no such offer. Run! Run! Run to your master and give him this message! I come for him! This cutscene plays no matter what. The story of Shadow of War is linear. It's not a result of the Nemesis system but it's made so much more impactful because of it. You didn't just mow down some dudes that the game told you to hate. They earned becoming villains by actually killing me and by being memorable enough for me to hold a grudge. This cutscene without the nemesis system isn't that impactful. I mean, it's essentially just, y'all's a bunch of pussies. But with the nemesis system, it's a victory lap. I could go on and on about the Nemesis system, because it's so impressive on a technical level and truly engrossing on a narrative one. It has betrayals and rises and falls and friends and foes. Every random enemy has the potential to become your greatest foe. Attention! Attention! Attention. Just stay calm. I have a lot to say about the Bioshock franchise. So much to say that really it deserves its own video where I actually review the games. But I can summarize my feelings on Bioshock 1, and especially Infinite, with a little quote I seem to appreciate more and more with each passing year. We have to continually be jumping off cliffs, and developing our wings on the way down. Bioshock Infinite was an ambitious title. It's a game I've grown to have... issues with over the years, but it was clearly the product of incredible effort and passion. Bioshock Infinite seems to have been more difficult to develop than the genetically engineered cat girls that science has still failed to deliver. I'll believe in global warming, and germ theory, and space, and gravity, and the female orgasm. After I've got a cat girl, and not a moment before. Bill Gardner, one of the development leads on Infinite, said there was enough cut from it to make five or six full games. But what particularly interested me when looking into Bioshock Infinite's development was this quote from Ken Levine. You haven't had that thing that communicates to everybody the promise of what a video game can be. Bioshock Infinite, despite being a commercial and critical success, killed its developer, Irrational Games. Its development was the type of expensive nightmare that AAA publishers have to go to years of therapy over. A studio that had been pushing the envelope from System Shock 2 all the way to Bioshock Infinite was killed by the very ambition that made it successful. As a matter of fact, Bioshock Infinite's codename while in development? Project Icarus. The next Bioshock is rumored to be in development by a new studio called Cloud Chamber, but it's out of the hands of its original creators. There have been some nasty rumors that Bioshock is destined to be the next live service disaster, but we'll see. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Alright Mr. 2K, this is my design proposal for the next Bioshock. Bioshock? Is that the gun game? Gun game? Well, I mean, they're first-person shooters, but they're not really about... I've heard enough. Milk it. Excuse me? Milk it. Loot boxes, microtransactions, multiplayer, you know the deal. When is it ready for release? Well, we're in the very early planning stages right now. Doesn't matter. Comes out in six months. 
Well, that's not possible. We, we could rush out something that's barely functional, but that means we're all gonna have to work 80-hour weeks. You can't keep doing this to us. My wife keeps complaining that she doesn't see me for months at a time. You have a wife? I don't remember authorizing that. Regardless, you think my husband complains about my work schedule? I work 20-hour weeks sometimes. He misses me, but he keeps quiet because he knows how easily I get violent. Have you tried hitting her? No! Also, wow, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Like the fact that I'm gay? Um, no. More the domestic abuse and the need to have my marriage authorized? And the 20 hour- It's 2020. Does it bother you that I'm gay? What? No, of course not. I Listen, Jerry, go down to HR. They've got some pamphlets on how to properly hit your wife so she keeps quiet. That's horrible! I know! So pointlessly gendered and problematic. It should be how to hit your spouse. Gameplay always tells a story, whether intentional or not, although it's usually not a particularly interesting story. That story of the time you almost died but then didn't, or the story of that time you climbed a goddamn tower is usually about as far as it goes. Gameplay is a sequence of actions, and a story, although just the bare minimum of a story, is a sequence of actions. The story that gameplay tells can be a more interesting one, though. It can be a story about that time you ran over a bunch of people, and the cops started chasing you, and you stole a plane and got away. That story of the time you walked into Whiterun and heard, Do you get to the Cloud District very often? What the actual fuck did you just say to me right now? <clears throat> but how do you turn gameplay into a really interesting story? Perhaps even the only story in a game. Well, what if your actions were remembered by NPCs over the entire course of the game? Let's say, hypothetically, Nazim remembers being hit. What if those NPCs interacted with each other as well? Let's say, hypothetically, Nazim tells the Jarl I attacked him, and tries to get the Jarl to place a bounty on my head. What if those NPCs had, like, a programmed personality? You know, likes and dislikes and fears and goals? therefore giving them all unique reactions to player actions. Let's say, hypothetically, the Jarl likes Nazim, so he places the bounty on my head. If the Jarl liked me more because I'd done quests for him or helped someone else he liked, the bounty wouldn't be placed. Let's say, hypothetically, I'm friends with the Queen in Solitude. Good friends. We get brunch every Sunday. I've done a lot of quests for her, and she doesn't remember me doing anything violent to her citizens before, so I convince her to get rid of that bounty. Hmm. Let's add events that can be triggered due to NPCs' relationships. Let's say, hypothetically, AOC sends me hot feet pics. I mean, the Jarl of Whiterun doesn't like my manipulation of the Queen. He says the crown has been corrupted by its decadent ritual of combining breakfast and lunch. Whiterun rebels, declaring itself to be the independent state of mimosas aren't even that good anyway, and the Queen sends me on a quest along with some of her men to bring them back into the Empire. What if instead of writing a story, with maybe some choice involved, a developer instead built a system of NPCs that interacted with each other and the player? Not just in a strategy game, but in a third or first person action game. Not just a nemesis system, but a system of neutral NPCs that can become friends or enemies depending on your actions. A game where the nuts and bolts plot is exclusively the player interacting with a system, and the developer only has to create fancy cinematics for the climaxes of the story. Fancy cinematics that are made much more impactful, not only because the system makes the cinematics more emotionally resonant, but because these story beats are a direct result of your actions. Is that even possible? Pfft. Come on. There'd be a gargantuan amount of writing work to be done alone. If a character could like you, love you, be neutral towards you, dislike you, or even hate you, all those lines would have to be recorded and written. I'm not in any way pretending there's a, there's a trivial amount of writing work to be done here. I think there's a substantial amount of writing work. The difference is because they bounce off each other and they, can, they play off each other, they're reusable. And they, and they can appear in different games, they can appear in different contexts, but there's still a full... Plenty big writing job to be done here. I'm not trying to write less. I'm trying to write stuff that can be reused and replayed in different contexts, but you're completely right. And starting to track that combinatorial explosion is gonna be, I think one of the first steps when you start doing the math to see how much stuff you can really support. But writing is relatively cheap. It's what, I, what excites me about this is the fact that it's different and it's driven by the player. So, you know, you, can, you have to scale that to taste and what you can afford. Gotcha, thanks. Thank you. 
Ken Levine, or Ken Levine, I'm going to use both of those pronunciations interchangeably, just get used to it. The former creative director at Irrational Games calls them narrative Legos. Irrational Games isn't dead. It downsized to less than a third of its old staff, rebranded, and is no longer developing Bioshock games. They are now Ghost Story games, and have been working on an unannounced game for years now with this small team, and apparently with this focus, to create a single-player game with a systemic story that's truly built on choice. Choices that are not designed, but generated by a system of characters and events that the player interacts with. Characters that have a constantly evolving relationship with the player, permanent and gameplay affecting decisions that put the player in situations that are unique to each playthrough. It's ambitious, and this is a studio with a history of flying too close to the sun. Gameplay and story are often, although not always, disconnected in games. And I think it's a deep foundational problem that's inherent to the conventional approach. Because gameplay is about the player exercising their will within the confines of a system, whereas a story, even if it has a lot of choice in it, is still fairly linear. The amount of choices you make is restricted because only so many things can be done, developers or people operating within budgetary and time constraints. There are games that prioritize choice and branching paths, but I often still feel railroaded by authorial intent. I'm an advocate for choice in games, but each choice has to be designed for and planned by developers. My interaction with the orcs and civs is still constrained. I only have a limited amount of things I can do in both systems. I often feel surprised when a choice that I want to make isn't present in a game. But a system can communicate clearly to you what you can and can't do, so you just sort of forget what you can't do. I know I can't romance the orcs in Shadow of War, but that doesn't bother me because I know what I can do. But when I found a few dudes chopping people up in a basement in Fallout, went to tell the town guards, and realized I couldn't, I was disappointed. I felt limited, because I couldn't see why I couldn't. Each quest in Fallout is written, and it's inevitable when designing choices in a game that you can't account for every player's desire. That's not Interplay's fault, that's reality. It's great that they provided me with options later in the quest, but later in the quest I also wanted to backstab the guy selling human meat, and I couldn't do that because they didn't anticipate it. But still, I respect any game that lets me choose. I think what bothered me the most in Bioshock Infinite was its mockery of choice. It played into the overall narrative, but it's still just frustrating as a player. Come on, let me through. Heads. Or tails. <laughs> Heads. Told you. Hmm. I never find that as satisfying as I'd imagined. Chin up. There's always next time. I suppose there is. I think that was a rational game's frustration bleeding through into the game. Looking at what Bioshock Infinite was going to be shows a game filled with branching choices and open-ended situations the player could influence, but they all got cut. I think they were frustrated by the massive potential of games, which goes hand in hand with how impossible the task of truly fulfilling that potential would be. One or more writers can't anticipate every player's desires, but a system of rules that you operate within? Where they don't so much write a story, but write a rule book that is clearly communicated? Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite show a studio really resenting typical narrative design in games. Would you kindly, a man chooses, a slave obeys, the bird or the cage, heads or tails, lines or choices that themselves mock player choice because at the end of the day they're clearly frustrated that they can't give you true choice. They can only give you questions where the only answers available have been designed for and approved by them. Bioshock is probably dead. Its original creators now have nothing to do with it, and it's probably going to turn into another goddamn live service nightmare, but is it dead? Was Bioshock just about shooting guns and plasmids at some political nutcases in fantastical locations? If you set a new Bioshock on the moon and had you killing communists, would it feel like Bioshock? I don't think so. Because what Bioshock was just so happened to be what killed it. Bioshock was narrative ambition. A commentary on, and then later, a failed attempt to address, the inherent difficulties with writing a great video game story. Ken Levine says in his talk that this isn't some announcement for a game he's working on, because it wasn't. It's an approach he wants to try, and has been discussing intermittently throughout the past seven years or so in interviews. Even if this video didn't live up to its title, and you're not hyped for a, you know, hypothetical game, 
I only ask that you respect Levine's boldness. He walked away from guaranteed success to work on this game. So to do something really different, we really had to go back to the drawing board, and that required uh, a new structure, um, a smaller group of people, and time. That was the most important thing. Time to fail. Time to fail for a long period where you don't have 150 people who are looking at you and saying, dude, you know, what am I supposed to be doing today? I don't think he just wants to be successful and be in charge of a million people cranking out hit games. I think he wants to make that thing that communicates to everybody the promise of what a video game can be. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, by and by, is a better home awaiting in the sky.